Hello everyone, it is now four o'clock central time, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Kirsten Brazier and I am going to present uh, ICS Security 101 Fundamentals for Aspiring Security Practitioners. This is my first time doing a uh, 101 talk, so I hope that I'm able to, to do you all justice with this. And if not, um, I will improve it and deliver it at another time. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is an overview of critical infrastructure and control systems. I'm going to do uh, an overview of the attack surface and vulnerabilities in ICS systems and discuss secure architecture and defense strategies, uh, some trends that I found in my research, uh, including some the differences between IoT and OT, which is operational technology for those of you who are not familiar. I'm going to uh, do a brief overview of regulatory processes as they map to the regulatory standards, um, look at the intersection of race and cybersecurity threats. Um, Camille Stewart published uh, an article about this earlier this week, and I thought it was really great, so I wanted to bring it up, uh, and also discuss where you fit in the, the future of protecting critical infrastructure. Um, just a little bit about me. I am a mom first. Uh, I have been in, um, in security for about 10 years now. I, I started out in, um, in insurance defense and I also have experience in retail environment. And my most recent experience for the last four plus years has been in uh, a power utility company. I did not start out and take a straight path to where I am. I'm one of those people that I had to go to the side and to the front and to the back and up and down to finally get where um, I ended up today. And so I wanted to make sure that I, I shared a human side of myself with you all because we, especially in our industry, people make it seem as though you, you, you start out coding or you may start out um, speaking multiple languages and you can start out and you're like this superhuman person. Well, we're not. Some of us are just normal people that got into security um, and it's something that we enjoyed and so ended up staying there. And so for me, um, and there's been a push recently about um, making sure that we normalize uh, getting education after a certain age. I wanted to put it out there and make sure that anyone who may feel like it's too late for them um, to, to understand. I know certainly from my experience, I, I had children by the time I got my bachelor's degree. And then as you can see from the screen, uh, my children were quite a bit older by the time I got my master's degree. And I've continued to get uh, to pursue continuous improvement for myself here just recently getting my uh, GICSP. And so I want everyone to know that there are no age limits on any of your goals and please do not ever give up on yourself. So the first thing I wanna start out with is what is the difference between IT and OT? A lot of people mistakenly think that it's the same, but it's not. So we'll go through briefly what some of the differences are, the main differences from my uh, experience. Primary drivers and information technology is usually is the money, it's time to market, it's who can get their products or services uh, deployed the fastest to the market. Well, in OT, the primary driver is safety and availability. They have to have their systems available. Um, and we also have to make sure that everything that we do takes safety into consideration first and foremost. The life cycle of systems in IT is typically three to five years whereas the life cycle of OT uh, systems is 10 to 40 years, particularly in uh, large manufacturing sites, power utility companies, they tend to buy products and, uh, that last um, a really, really long time. Patching is available uh, for most IT assets versus in OT because those devices, because those assets uh, are built to last so long that patching is normally not readily available. In IT, if you patch something, you can have a, a minor inconvenience. Maybe your system goes down for a little while, but there's not really uh, that much of a, uh, a disruption to the business. Whereas in OT, uh, a patch, if it 
it, it can really it can cause injuries and uh, possibly in some instances fatalities. Uh, IT ten, tends to have standard protocols and systems. Everybody's familiar with. We have Windows. We have Linux. Uh, we have pretty much everything is standard. Your standard, your port 80, uh, port 443. Well, when you get into OT, a lot of the, uh, the systems and protocols are proprietary. So now that we've talked about what is the difference between IT and OT, let's talk about what is actually critical infrastructure. For those of you who are not aware, the government definition of that is uh, the assets, systems, and networks whether physical or virtual, that are considered so vital to the U.S. that the incapacitation or destruction could cause a debilitating effect on national security, uh, economic security, public health, safety, or a combination thereof. Now, that sounds really complicated and scary. So cool. Why should you care? What does all this mean? Critical infrastructure, your life depends on all of it. It's your food, uh, how your food gets to you, your bank, the, you work so hard for your money, it's, it's the banking system, the chemicals that go into your car, the chemicals that go into your gas, the chemicals that go into your, your skin products, uh, your, the communications infrastructure that you are depending on to be able to uh, participate in a webinar such as this one, your manufacturing, the, the safety of your cars, uh, the, the, uh, the dams that hold water back, especially in low-lying areas, uh, and that particularly um, it uh, normally ha is harmful to under um, to communities that are underserved. Your emergency services, you depend on the fire department, uh, police departments, ambulances, all of that is considered critical infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, energy, your, your gas, your electricity, uh, healthcare, every uh, information technology, which again, you are depending on IT uh, to be able to participate in the webinar such as this one. Uh, the nuclear facilities, that's about 20% of the energy in the United States is produced uh, using nuclear energy. Uh, the Postal Service, why is that important? Is, is really right now, especially because we have uh, a lot of uh, efforts to suppress voters, the, the post office right now is more important than ever. And of course, your transportation systems, uh, your rail, your planes, um, and then water, which is very important, um, especially, I don't know if we, for everyone that's not aware of, there's still continues to be clean water issues in Flint. So we have all this critical infrastructure, and that's great, but they're all interconnected together. And out of all of the critical infrastructure, there's one that is more uh, more important than the other because it all the others depend on the one, which is energy. Uh, that's where my most recent experience is, and so that's where you're going to see a lot of my presentation is uh, geared towards energy. One of the first things you have to understand when trying to get into critical infrastructure is what is the difference between distributed control systems and uh, SCADA systems, which is your supervisory control and data acquisition. Your distributed control systems, they pretty much monitor everything that the SCADA systems are doing. Uh, as opposed to your SCADA system, they are acquiring data from all the devices. They are controlling all the processes at all the sites, uh, particularly uh, in a power utility company is controlling the flow of electricity to those sites. Your uh, DCS also monitors all the processes and the process states of all of the, the activities that are happening at the control system level. Uh, and the uh, SCADA systems are more geared towards uh, controlling the events that happen on those systems. So then what are those systems that make up uh, control systems? What kind of control systems are there? Some of these are, um, are used in other uh, critical control systems. Uh, I'm sorry, critical infrastructure, but for the most part, you'll see this, this is common. The ones that I'm gonna talk about are common across uh, energy companies. So SCADA, I just mentioned what SCADA, what SCADA is. So your SCADA are gonna be your control systems um, and they control other systems such as uh, PLCs and RTUs, which I'll give a definition of those here in a minute. Uh, your intelligent electronic devices. These are all of your smart devices. Now we have smart, we, smart meters on homes. 
Um, the programmable logic controllers, which is your PLCs, those are ruggedized computers that control processes such as robotics and manufacturing. Your historians, uh, they are systems that are used to record and retrieve critical process data. So like in a power utility company, for example, it's used to, uh, to build customers. Uh, your RTUs, uh, sometimes you will hear people refer to it as re remote transmission. Some people refer to it as remote terminal units. Um, those convert analog systems, uh, analog signals to digital systems. And they are used for remote monitoring and control of various device types. Uh, your open platform communication servers, those convert hardware communications to open platform communications, which helps negate the need for custom drivers for uh, process control devices. This really comes uh, into, uh, into view when you have uh, the, all the different device types that may all use a different protocol. So that's, it's just it's easier to, to have something that converts it all into one uh, readable type. Uh, your sensors are used to make real-time decisions based on conditions. Um, this is really, really important when it comes to safety in instrumentation systems. And then your HMIs are just graphical inner interfaces that are used to manage process controls on a controlled uh, machinery. So what are the attack vectors on all of these different types of systems? So we have uh, a similar uh, situation in OT that you do in IT where your systems cannot be patched for one reason or another. So IT, you will have uh, some servers and applications that cannot be patched for one reason or another. Well, you have the same thing in the OT environment. Uh, there's homegrown applications and, and custom uh, off-the-shelf applications that were deployed either before secure development life cycles came about or even after where some people are just not still in 2020 not using uh, OWASP to do, perform, to do the testing before they get a product out the door because getting it the time to market is more important than security. Um, some of your other some of your others are unnecessary ports and services enabled. So for those of you who are not aware about the ports and services piece of it, you always wanna make sure that you, uh, that you don't um, have ports and services enabled that are not necessary on a device. And some, some devices, because the, the technicians are not security professionals, they don't understand the importance of disabling all the inputs that someone else can take advantage of. Um, the in OT we have insecure protocols such as Modbus, DMP, um, and then they the same ones that are used in IT, FTP and Telnet. You have the same thing where it's either uh, clear text or they lack authentication. There's just lots of secure insecure protocols that are used in uh, OT, and then you have your still your common app, common application flaws. A lot of them just like a regular web application in IT. Uh, is susceptible to buffer overflows and remote code execution, you have the same exact thing happening in your OT environment. So is critical infrastructure under attack? Absolutely, every area of it is. So I just, I pulled up just a few of uh, the recent attacks here over the last 10 years, looking at some of the bigger ones. Uh, there's the Urgent 11, which uh, attacked medical devices and hospital networks in Triton. And there was an attack on safety instrumented systems. And for those of you who are not aware of um, what sa the safety instrumented systems are used uh, to, to shut off if something is going to cause uh, injury or loss of life, they, are they use safety instrumented systems uh, to shut off whatever process it is that's going to cause the attack. Uh, are going to cause uh, the issue. There is a cryptocurrency attack at a wastewater site in 2017. The campaign did not have a name, but uh, it attacked wastewater sites. Uh, Ukraine was hit by both Black en Energy and and, and Industroyer. Uh, the power outages back in 2015 and 2016. Uh, there was a Dragos produced uh, a great report on that. If anyone wants more information. Uh, Havex also hit energy grids. And then of course, Stuxnet, Stuxnet is probably the bigger one that people are familiar with, which uh, damaged Iran's nuclear program. 
So when you get into OT environments, you will all, everyone should have at least some uh, familiarity with the Purdue model because this is what should be used uh, and has been around for a while to help build out secure ICS infrastructures. So if you see at your level one, you have all your sensors, your actuators, all of your safety instrument, uh, safety systems are usually at uh, level zero and level one. And then you'll see you have your PLCs, uh, your control progress, control processors, RTUs, all those are also at level one. Um, operation support, that's where you're gonna have your engineering workstations. Uh, and what's important about understanding this is that it, it helps you to visualize where your enforcement zones need to be. And so it also helps you to determine, okay, my firewalls need to be here. Uh, this is where I need to enforce traffic restrictions. This is where I need to make sure that I have uh, visibility into these assets. Uh, so this kind of gives you a visual representation if you're trying to figure out, okay, architecturally, where should these assets sit and where should I place my protections? Uh, the Purdue model has been around for a while and uh, is a great reference model to use. So what are some secure architecture and defense strategies? So we know that uh, graphically, I just showed you what it should look like, but what are some specific architecture and defense strategies? Some of them are going to be the same as IT, um, but some of them will not. So the first thing I will tell you is make sure that when you're communicating with anyone in the ICS environment that you communicate to them with a focus on safety. Uh, your fancy security tools and terminology is great for you, but they don't care. What they care about is safety. And so make sure that when you're going to communicate with them that that is what the focus of your conversations are. Uh, effective communication is a struggle. Uh, we, especially in IT, there's articles, you can read one article after another about how uh, OT hates IT uh, and vice versa. And it's because IT historically has gone and tried to impose um, IT processes onto the OT staff. Well, they have different priorities. And so you have to make sure that you're establishing, if you wanna be successful, establishing those relationships, not trying to force them to learn your language, but meeting them where they are and communicating with them in language that they care about. Your documentation. So people, it's something that's devalued in the industry. Um, so it's compliance and governance, but those are the things that will save you. And uh, especially in our industry, when you, so critical infrastructure is typically highly regulated. So there has to be someone maintaining the documentation and compliance and governance. And so what that means is that for the people who, you know, your type A personalities that may not enjoy doing documentation or may think that compliance is beneath them, that's actually what the business cares about because that is a business driver. Uh, that is what allows uh, a company, specifically power utility companies, that allows them to stay in business. And so you have to make sure that you are the person that even if other people feel like it's it's something that's not valued, that's actually what the business cares about. And you always want to be on the side of the business, uh, on the side of the things that the business cares about. Require uh, multi-factor authentication for remote access. Uh, it seems like a given, but it's not always uh, implemented and it's also not always implemented correctly. So if you have uh, any expertise in how to uh, deploy remote access to those systems, then that's a good place for you to, uh, to lend your expertise. Make sure that you have uh, firewall rules and access control reviews uh, on a regular basis. You'd be surprised where um, some companies, because the, the documentation is, is like, it's, it's considered secondary or not as important as something else, then these are the things that that's how things are allowed to fall through the cracks. And that's how those uh, communications uh, that shouldn't be allowed, they fall through the cracks. And so make sure that if you can have a process in place to do those uh, firewall rules and access reviews that you do that. It'll also help you to learn a lot about uh, the business. 
make sure that you have the strictest limitations to uh, around uh, authentication and communication with your level zero uh, through two assets, particularly because that's where your safety, um, your safety in instrumentation systems tend to be. And it's also where it is where all of your controls are, the control systems. Uh, your patching and network segmentation where feasible. Uh, patching is not always available. I mentioned that earlier for these types of systems. Um, and then network segmentation is not always feasible. So that's why I always I like to um, to to caveat that would make with where feasible, and with all of your controls, make sure that you have visibility into the assets. Companies continue to struggle with uh, asset management, and so you can't protect or detect what you don't know about. And so if you're a person that has any type of influence over that process. Uh, make sure that you are uh, are advocating for the asset management piece so that you can put uh, the detective controls around them. So I had an interesting uh, conversation this week that I thought was a good use case uh, to share with you all. And, and I often I see this on social media as well. It comes up from time to time about whether end to end encryption uh, is will solve all of our problems. And so if you are in an interview or just in conversations with your peers and the use case comes up, is end-to-end -end encryption necessary in uh, the ICS environment? Your answer should always be, well, that depends. Uh, information, data without context is, is, is not always valuable. There's also the consideration of, okay, if we encrypt everything, then we lose visibility into uh, what we need to do effective incident response. And then there's also backwards compatibility issues that you always have to look at. So if you are ever asked this question, make sure that you frame the conversation around, okay, what is the context of the data that you're talking about? Um, are there backwards? Have we looked at all of the interdependencies and backwards compatibility with, uh, especially with legacy systems and, and homegrown apps, making sure that you're looking at all those things. And also data encryption at what piece? If it's inside of the network, maybe it doesn't need to be uh, encrypted and you just need to encrypt it once it gets past a certain point. So just being able to have those conversations will help you get to better answers. So is tribal knowledge needed in order to get uh, a job in ICS? The answer is yes and no. Um, yes, because people, it, it's more of a trust issue where if you have that tribal knowledge, then people feel more comfortable with the solutions that you're proposing. But the other side of that is most companies are going through a digital transformation, which is making tribal knowledge um, less valuable. So if you're a person that's considering, am I smart enough to go into uh, ICS security? Do I know enough? Um, you know, is, is this somewhere where I belong? What if I don't have the tribal knowledge that this other person that's been working there for 20 years has? there is value in bringing in fresh perspectives and certainly going forward with the digital transformations that a lot of these companies are undergoing because your technical knowledge and your communication skills, which historically uh, doesn't exist in some of these environments, it's, it's, it will add value to the teams and add value um, that may not exist at the moment. So this is one of the um, career map things, uh, graphics that is floating around online. And when I know the billion dollar question is, well, how do I get into uh, ICS security? Some people are trying to figure out how to get in security in general. Some people trying to get into ICS security specifically. And when you look at something like this, um, it, it's overwhelming. And then same thing for the certification charts that are available out there. 
looking at something like this, I know when I was earlier in my career, it's I would look at something like this and you get overwhelmed because it's like, so I have to spend all my time constantly learning and constantly getting certifications, um, especially because earlier uh, in our in my career before I met people who were succeeding without uh, the alphabet soup of certifications behind their name, I thought incorrectly that I had to go down the same path. So then what does all this mean? And what is a path for you? And what should you do? Well, if you want to get into ICS security, first understand that it is a, a, a journey of lifelong learning. Um, a good place to start out is uh, a general certification, especially if you're completely new to the industry. You always want to make sure that you at least have that base knowledge available. So I would recommend at least getting one or two uh, general certifications and then specialize using an ICS track. So uh, SANS right now, uh, they have the ICS SCADA Security Essentials course. Um, where it will give you pretty much a, a foundation of what is needed, uh, at least what you need to know to even be in these environments. Uh, this is the, I, I took this course myself uh, in order to get my, uh, to do my GSP, GICSP uh, three weeks ago. And I thought it was a great course. It's actually listed as uh, an entry level course. I disagree with that. I don't, I think this is more of an intermediate cert uh, especially for someone who, if you've never worked in a manufacturing environment or uh, any type of large company that has controls, uh, control systems, then a lot of the stuff is going to be foreign to you. And so, but it is a good foundation for someone who is looking to get started. And then once you get further along, uh, the essentials for NERC, uh, NERC critical infrastructure protection, that's really specifically geared towards power utility companies. The power utility companies uh, and nuclear nuclear plants have specific regulatory requirements that they have to meet around cybersecurity for them to continue to operate. And so this is a good introduction. If you've never worked in, in those environments, it's a good introduction to it. And then once you get further along uh, and more mature in, in your career, there is, of course, the uh, active defense and incident response course and then the cybersecurity in depth. And so again, we go to the billion dollar question. Well, what do I need to do? How do I even get into one of these companies? Uh, and I think about this question a lot because I get it so much. Uh, and I hate that I can't always give straight answers. And so I'm just, I'm continuing to refine how I'm responding to the question myself. And so, but I've come up with this uh, basic flow chart of this is what this would be if I had to go back and do it all over again, these are the things that I would do and do differently. And so um, uh, make sure you assess your own strengths and your own interests. What is it that you want to do? Do you want to work in manufacturing? Do you want to work in healthcare? Do you want to work in a power utility company? Is that something that you think you would enjoy? Are you a blue teamer? Are you a red teamer? Are you a policy person? Are you a technical writer? Do you enjoy governance risk and compliance? Are you more of a technical person? Look at what your strengths are and what your interests are. And then you can identify the five to seven companies that align with your values. The reason I recommend five to seven companies is because if you cast your net too wide, it'll be overwhelming. So identify the five to seven companies that align with your values. And what I mean by that is you go to their website and they have uh, people who look like you <laughs> on their website, because uh, that'll give you a clear indication of whether or not they actually value diversity. Uh, make sure that they are community centered and that they um, that they give back to the communities that they serve. If you want to um, make sure they have the benefits and the pay that you want, um, but you have to look at all of those things, make sure that they're good corporate citizens. So just identify those companies that align with your personal values. And then 
think about where do you want to work? Again, do you want to work in a nuclear plant? Do you want to work in healthcare? Do you want to work in the banking sector? Do you want to work in waste utilities? You have to figure out where you personally want to work and where you want to contribute and where you want to add value. And if you don't want to work in one of the specific companies, because there's limitations to uh, working in those companies as well, you typically have to, especially for those of us, if you want to publish research, for example, or if you want to be out in the community um, doing uh, presentations, you're under NDAs, uh, uh, you're under NDAs and you're limited to the things that you can discuss out in public and the research that you can publish. So you have to look at all of those things. You can also look at, there are, are companies right now, security technology companies that specialize in, uh, in ICS security. So you can look at those as well. And some of those include uh, Clarity, uh, Dragos, Nozomi, uh, Tripwire, Belden. Uh, and then there's also uh, some of the hardware companies like Schweitzer Engineering uh, Labs, Rockwell Automation, Honeywell. Look at those companies that are that meet whatever your specific criteria is for where you want to work. And if you're trying to figure out, okay, I can't, I don't know, I want to work at a power utility company, but I don't necessarily know how to get in there. Well, go and look at the companies that serve them. That may be the way for you to get in. Make sure that you're networking with people at your target companies. They're between LinkedIn, Twitter, the virtual conferences. Uh, there's multiple ways that you can network with people and you have to come up with a plan, right? Uh, and you also have to make sure that no one wants to feel like they are being used either. And so you have to make sure that you're that you add value to that person's life, or you add value to uh, the community, or you you just you have to add value. Excuse me before you start asking for stuff. So review uh, job openings at your five to seven target companies. Uh, if you look at the job descriptions, a lot of them will say they're looking for someone with uh, Splunk experience, for example. They're looking for someone with Archer experience. They're looking for someone with Cisco experience. They're looking at some for someone with Tripwire experience. A lot of these companies, they list the security technologies that they use in their environment. And so I encourage you, especially for those of you that are, you know, you may feel like, well, I work in a SOC and so I don't qualify to work here. Yes, you do. The, the, uh, the larger companies are going to be using the same technologies that uh, that you're using in your current role. And so make sure that you're not limiting yourself uh, based on what you may feel that you uh, may not check the 200 boxes on the job descriptions. Uh, skill up if necessary. You may have to go get additional skills. You may have to go you know, spend the next six months and invest in yourself so that you can get uh, some additional skills so that you can land your target role. Don't be afraid to do that. If you're in a company, if you're in a power utility company, you're at a gas company, you're at a water utility company, and you just can't figure out how to pivot from the role that you're in, well, request the stretch assignment. Request um, to collaborate with someone on a, a security project. Uh, volunteer to do some of the, the documentation, because I can assure you <laughs> that their documentation is lacking. Um, and don't be afraid to take alternative routes into the industry, especially for those of you who are new. Again, you know, the compliance piece is uh, historically is undervalued, but compliance became technical about 10 years ago. And so the industry has yet to catch up to that. So while other people may be telling you that, you know, compliance, you're not uh, you're not a real security professional because you're doing compliance. Uh, that's not true, especially in heavily regulated companies. They're, all their compliance is technical. Uh, same thing for uh, technical writing, uh, and audit positions. Those are also um, security related positions in these companies. 
So make sure that you're not limiting yourself based on what someone in the industry may be saying uh, is not a real something in security. Other things that you can do. How do you stand out from the crowd? So one of the things that I had started doing before I resigned from uh, my last position last week was I was doing lunch and learns at the company. And it was really, really effective. It was a, a great way to get out and learn the business and also allow me to constantly work on my communication skills. Your communication skills should never be something that you stop working on. And doing lunch and learns allows you to, to forge relationships in companies and it allows you to build a skill set that is invaluable. So I encourage you to, uh, if you're doing lunch and learns, and if you're trying to, to get someone in security specifically, uh, trying to get their attention and, and put yourself on their radar, then lunch and learns are a great way to do that. Uh, the certifications that are the specialty certifications I mentioned, uh, the GICSP, uh, there's the G GCIP, there are uh, certain uh, certifications that are specialty certifications. Same thing with the technology certifications, there, there's Splunk certifications, there's all kinds of certifications that are specialized. And so it, by having those specialty certifications, it's a great way for you to stand out from, uh, from the crowd. Uh, I can't emphasize enough doing security community volunteer work. Uh, I, anybody who has known me for more than five minutes, uh, I tell you all the time about volunteering. And I, I've, over the years, I've, I've reaped the benefits of doing that. Um, and, and it really here recently, uh, even as of last week, when I published uh, a post saying that I was exploring new opportunities, because I've given so much to the community, the over, the response to my post that was just a random post uh, was overwhelming. And so I encourage you to, to get out, uh, volunteer in the, secu the security community, whether that's publishing research, um, whether it's uh, volunteering for, for something like this, uh, the webinars, um, just find a way to get back to the community because you will always get it back. And then finally, uh, solve those problems that other people run from, right? You have um, an, an example would be, so right here in the last seven to eight months, there were uh, broken processes that people had run from for years. And a lot of times problems are so big that, and everyone knows that they're big and everyone knows that they're broken, but people are afraid to put themselves out there. If there is a problem that you can lend your expertise to, to solve it, yes, it will be hard. Um, yes, you're going to face headwinds. Yes, all of those things. But that is where your growth comes from. And so if you have a problem that if, if it's in your org or if it's in the security community or anywhere where you see a problem that's really big, but people are running from it, solve that problem. That's how you stand out from the crowd. So I'm including the NERC SIP and any IO 809 in here because if you, if anyone, if you're, if you desire to go work in a power utility company or a, uh, a nuclear plant, they have certain cybersecurity requirements that they are required to be compliant with in order for them to operate. So anyone who is able to map the cybersecurity standards to the controls in an environment is the person who will make themselves invaluable. Um, the, when you look at them on their face, I know specifically the, the NERC SIP standards, the, the book, the, the physical book is about, I think 600 pages. So it looks like a lot and it can be overwhelming when you get a book that's 600 pages and then you have to marry that to a technical manual that is 800 pages. And then you have to put the people part on top of it and make it all work. That is where you demonstrate value. 
the people that can do that are the ones that can demonstrate value. Same thing with NEIO 809, the nuclear plants, they have to be compliant with uh, the standards and requirements. And it's the same thing. You have all your controls in the environment and how do you map them to these standards? It's also when you're talking to people, being able to have an intelligent conversation about mapping those controls to processes in an environment, it makes you stand out because a lot of people have a, um, have a surface level understanding of both of these requirements, but the person that spends the time and really understands what they mean, including reading the guidelines and technical basis, which is where the devil's in the details, that's where those details are, that's where you're going to find the most value. Some other resources that I recommend if you're looking to get into ICS security, uh, the, excuse me, ISA has lots of information uh, there. You have to pay for theirs. And so that would be, I should have probably put that last, but I was trying to have the slide formatted so that it's like the smallest stuff to the longest. Um, but if you have, uh, if you're able to get access to it, uh, especially if you can have a company to pay for, then that's a great place to start. Uh, your ICS cert advisories, there are cert advisories that are specific to ICS environments. It gives you a good idea of uh, how we're being attacked and where the vulnerabilities are. Dragos produces amazing research. I highly recommend uh, their white papers. Uh, the Cybersecurity and, and Infrastructure Security Agency has tons of resources on their website. And of course, uh, the NERC SIP standards, which is where I just mentioned. And then NIST also has a guide to ICS cybersecurity that can help you to, to understand uh, more about what is required uh, in the environment, to secure the environment. Some of the trends um, that I've seen and observed, uh, there's lots of, if you go to uh, company websites, uh, and this is also based on interviews that I've been having in the last week or so, there are major, major uh, cybersecurity budget increases that are specific to the OT environment. And so when you're going to these websites, don't, if you want to work in, uh, if you want to support ICS specifically, make sure that you're looking at the ones that say uh, OT. A lot of companies are just now in the last three to four years starting to separate their security teams to have one security team focus on the corporate, the enterprise environment, and the rest of certain people on the team are dedicated to OT security. That historically had not been the case. And I'm increasingly seeing that, uh, seeing jobs that are specific to OT cybersecurity posted on websites and also just people reaching out to me directly. There's, there's now, there's a focus on OT security uh, for a myriad of reasons. It's, it's not just a cybersecurity piece, but companies are struggling with compliance. And so uh, it's a great time for you to, if you're looking to get into security or pivot from uh, enterprise security into OT security, right now is a great time because there's budget increases. Uh, there's heightened interest in ICS, uh, the smart technology. Lots of companies across the United States, specifically the power utility companies, have deployed advanced metering infrastructure um, with security as an afterthought. And so what you're going to see is, uh, or what we've observed is in, uh, in online forums that there's heightened interest in uh, the smart technology uh, the smart systems that have been deployed all over the country. Uh, there's an increase in ransomware in, within ICS environments. I went through a few of them earlier. Um, and of course, there's also the manifestation of uh, cyber physical events where someone will do something, um, they'll hack into a system that now causes some physical activity to happen. Um, I mentioned one of them earlier with uh, safety systems being shut down. Um, there's uh, oil wells have been uh, affected. There's just there's lots of uh, of scenarios where that we've now seen a manifestation of those cyber uh, and physical events. 
And then I'm also seeing uh, industry partnerships. Uh, SEL has a partnership with Drago's. And so now you're seeing the partnerships happen where the hardware companies are partnering with the uh, security support companies so that visibility is, is like a one solution, which is a great thing. So Camille Stewart published a, uh, a report, um, an article on uh, earlier this week about the intersection of race and cyber. Uh, systemic racism is a cybersecurity threat. I encourage all of you to go read it. Uh, I had never seen anyone be able to articulate and tie the two together the way she did. She's brilliant. I highly recommend you all follow her on Twitter as well. Um, I have her Twitter handle there is Camille Esquire, Camille ESQ. Um, and so some of the things that I just wanted to highlight, some of the things that she talked about was uh, about the disinformation campaigns that we saw in 2016 that affected voter turnout. There were, uh, and there continues to be disinformation campaigns. We're seeing it play out every day um, where certain communities are being targeted to discourage them from voting. Certain communities are being targeted um, and being flat out told lies about certain candidates. Some communities are being targeted and told um, that their voting locations have changed. There's just lots of disinformation campaigns that are happening um, not just on the voter suppression side, but is, is making people uh, distrust systems and institutions. And so I want to make sure that uh, I, I encourage you all to go and read the, the article that she posted where she went into detail about these issues and more. And then I like how she tied it in at the end. She tied it all together. Um, and, and talked about, you know, building teams composed of diverse viewpoints and conscious of race issues can help to elevate the, those nuances, identify new tactics, techniques, and procedures, and adapt detection to relevant environments. We have been talking about diversity in this industry for too long. And I think we're finally starting to see um, that it, it's a problem. And so I hope that when people read her article and not just uh, what she said, but also just thinking about how companies have, have built um, solutions that are not their half-baked solutions and they haven't considered the perspectives of other people. And that's how they've ended up with gaps in their security and caused their companies to, to, to suffer breaches and unnecessary fines. And so I encourage you all to go and read the article that she published. So I've talked a lot. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll just summarize what are the key takeaways, what I would like for everyone to, to take away from this. Uh, critical infrastructure depends on safe and reliable energy. T women typically are not uh, in ICS security. Uh, I know when I, even when I posted jobs and was trying to recruit people uh, from the company where I left, we would never have women to apply. And so I encourage you uh, to make sure that you're applying to these positions. <coughs> Some of the work required in secure architecture, uh, uh, secure architecture, it requires historically undervalued work. Don't let these people uh, continue to undervalue that work. That is what is required in order for us to make sure that our environments are both secure and compliant and the compliance is a business driver. Uh, the new technologies means uh, less reliance on tribal knowledge. If you don't have their tribal knowledge, don't worry about it. We need new perspectives in the industry and we need new diverse protect perspectives in the industry. So I'm sorry, I didn't realize uh, I only have about a minute left. Are there any questions? Yes, so we received one question which is, is Ted Koppel's book, Lights Out, still up to date or have changes occurred? I have not read that book, so I cannot comment on that. Great, well, 
Those are all the questions we had received. We cannot thank you enough for your time and all of your insights. This was great information. Um, and thank you again.